Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Institute. Uh, my name is John Lenchowski. I'm president of the Institute. I teach here as well. For those of you who uh, are new to us, uh, we specialize in, uh, in teaching all of the different arts of statecraft uh, and how they are integrated in national strategy. And, uh, but we have a very active uh, public lecture series, and this uh, is a particularly important one for us. Uh, it's a series that we're very grateful to the Charles Koch Foundation for supporting it. It's going to be a series of lectures on grand strategy, where we're going to be looking at some of the, the different perspectives uh, on how on, on America's role in the world. And this is the inaugural lecture, and we're particularly proud to uh, have here to kick this thing off Professor uh, Michael Desch, uh, who is now pro professor and chairman of the political science department at the uh, University of Notre Dame. He is also co-director there of the International Security Program. Uh, professor Desch uh, has a very distinguished academic record. Uh, having uh, uh, been the founding director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs and the first holder of the Robert Gates Chair uh, in Intelligence and National Security Decision Making at the George Bush School of Government at Texas A&M. Uh, prior to that, he was a professor and director of the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. Uh, he has uh, served as an assistant director and senior research associate at the Olin Institute. Uh, he has also served on a Senate staff. He has served uh, as an analyst at the Congressional Research Service, as well as in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research in the Department of State. He's a prolific author who has written books on uh, U.S. policy in Latin America, when the Third World Matters in Latin America and U.S. Grand Strategy. He's also an authority on civil uh, military relations, uh, having written a book on civilian control of the military, and more recently his book entitled Power and Military Effectiveness, The Fallacy of Democratic Triumphalism. Uh, I'm particularly glad that Professor Desch has uh, uh, contributed not only to the scholarly literature, but to the opinion literature in the field of, of national security affairs. And so, I, without further ado, uh, we're honored to have you here, and welcome, and, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming out this evening. And I'm glad that John uh, mentioned the opinion literature, because uh, this talk tonight is uh, a little bit analytical, uh, but it's a lot polemical. So uh, I want you to think about it as uh, one big op-ed piece. Uh, I have done some real scholarship in my day, but uh, uh, this, I think, is a, a little bit different animal. Uh, this is my uh, first uh, visit uh, to the Institute for World Politics, beautiful uh, building. Uh, I do have a bone to pick with you, though, uh, about these chairs. A anytime you see really comfortable chairs like this, uh, you get a little bit nervous because uh, I don't want to uh, lull people into a, uh, a haze. Uh, and if the chairs are too comfortable, it'll uh, facilitate that process. Um, my palms are sweating. I hadn't realized that I'm the uh, inaugural uh, speaker in this series. So now I'm trying to think about how I'm going to uh, spin this. I guess you could say uh, it'll only go uphill from, uh, from here. Uh, so what I want to talk about tonight uh, is, uh, is a, a grand strategy of restraint uh, politically viable? And um, I had a great YouTube video clip here uh, that would have shown uh, the uh, intellectual uh, travails uh, of former Governor uh, Jeb Bush um, on the issue uh, of Iraq uh, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, you've all uh, probably seen it. Uh, 
poor Governor Bush was sort of tagged with the uh, ultimate uh, insult in politics, uh, that he was a flip-flopper. Um, but I'm a little bit sympathetic to uh, the governor. I don't think he was flip-flopping. Uh, I think that what we saw with Governor Bush is, uh, in fact, a microcosm uh, of a larger debate about foreign policy that's roiling uh, particularly uh, the Republican Party. Uh, and so my take on what was going on was not uh, Jeb the flip-flopper, but rather it was the internal existential struggle uh, of primary Jeb uh, against general elex uh, election Jeb. Um, and I'll try to uh, spin that uh, out for you here. So uh, I, I want to uh, just give you a little bit of a sense of where I want to go. Um, and this is why this, by the way, is uh, polemical rather than an uh, analytical talk. I think that the prima facie case for a grand strategy of restraint, 2015, 2016, uh, is quite compelling. Um, now that's an arguable proposition, and maybe you know we want to duke it out in the Q and A. Uh, but I want to use that uh, assumption that that's right as a starting point for the talk tonight, because there are many people in the restraint camp uh, and in other grand strategy camps as well uh, who might concede the merits of a grand strategy of restraint, um, but say uh, politically it just can't happen. Uh, it's not uh, viable. And the argument here is that primacy, uh, the main alternative to a grand strategy of restraint, uh, is basically bipartisan these days, spanning the gamut from uh, liberal imperialists in the Democratic Party, uh, like uh, the Clintons, uh, one and two, uh, to neoconservatives, uh, uh, George W. Bush, uh, most dramatically, but you know most of the Republican uh, aspirants uh, have signed on to uh, some version of primacy, uh, at least in the primary period. And indeed, I think the Re Republican Party has become, in some respects, the mirror image of the post-Vietnam Democratic Party. Uh, it's become ideologically extreme and rigid, particularly uh, on foreign policy issues. And indeed, there are some people in the party, I'm not going to name names, but uh, the senator from South Carolina uh, comes to mind, uh, who would rather maintain ideological purity um, than win elections. Now, the argument that I want to make to you tonight uh, is that despite all this, um, that uh, primacy, or excuse me, restraint, in fact, is politically feasible. Um, and in fact, uh, I think that uh, debate about foreign policy in the 2016 uh, campaign uh, is going to be more exciting within the Republican Party uh, than it will be uh, within the Democratic Party or even between the uh, two of them. So, a uh, quick roadmap. I want to just uh, go back to the analytical piece uh, and talk a little bit about what is grand strategy uh, and lay out some of the alternatives for you. Um, secondly, uh, I'll uh, just allude to uh, what I think are the merits of a grand strategy of restraint um, and then shamelessly shill for an article uh, that develops that at greater length in a recent issue of the Notre Dame magazine. Um, but really, the harder one I want to get to is uh, to talk about the politics of grand strategy, uh, particularly within the Republican Party, and tr try to make the argument that, uh, counterintuitive argument, I think, that restraint um, could be a uh, winner. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, the famous Lenin question, uh, what is to be done? Because I don't think that uh, restraint can be a uh, winning strategy uh, without a concert, uh, or position without a concerted strategy uh, to make it happen. So uh, what do I mean by grand strategy? Let's just be clear about that. When I talk about grand strategy, I'm talking about the interface uh, between uh, a state's foreign policy and how it uses its military instrument, okay? So it's basically about how you would use military force uh, to support your uh, preferred foreign policy objectives. Now, um, 
I say, and most people who uh, talk about grand strategy, uh, sort of talk about uh, four ideal, typical uh, grand strategic positions. Uh, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're uh, sort of analytical constructs. They don't exhaust the, the uh, waterfront, uh, but I think it gives you uh, basically uh, the lay of the land uh, for uh, the positions that uh, people would take uh, in at least our political uh, debate. Um, the first grand strategic option is primacy. And my shorthand is primacy is all about running the world unilaterally. Uh, think of the famous uh, 1992 defense policy guidance, uh, the abortive defense policy guidance that came out of the uh, Department of Defense during the waning days of the George H.W. Bush administration, uh, the, grant, the uh, DPG for a grand strategy that would prevent the emergence uh, of a peer competitor. Um, but really, the uh, classic example of a grand strategy of primacy was the grand strategy uh, of the Bush administration. Second grand strategic option is collective security. Um, and my shorthand for collective security is it's all about running the world but doing it multilaterally. Um, and the, uh, you know, the classic example of this was the Clinton grand strategy uh, uh, in the early uh, post-Cold War period, uh, the strategy of engagement and enlargement in which the United States was the indispensable nation uh, in a larger collective effort to uh, bring the, uh, uh, the benefits of uh, democracy and free markets to the rest of the world. Uh, a third grand strategy, and one uh, we are long familiar with, or at least uh, those of us with gray hair uh, who lived through the Cold War, um, is selective engagement. Uh, basically, uh, the grand strategy of containment. And with selective engagement, the idea is that you uh, defend uh, in a forward what manner uh, certain key areas of the world uh, multilaterally or in uh, uh, concert with your uh, allies. Um, and then finally, restraint. Um, and restraint, in my view, is a, uh, a unilateral approach uh, to grand strategy that involves uh, offshore balancing rather than direct commitment on the ground. Um, and also it relies quite heavily on the normal dynamics, <coughs> excuse me, of international politics as force multipliers ensuring uh, the protection of American national interests. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about this uh, in a second, about restraint. But first of all, I want to give you my theory of American grand strategy. And there are really two elements of it. Um, grand strategy is in part driven by the situation that a great power finds itself in in the world, including uh, the number of other great powers it faces, uh, the presence uh, of critical uh, military technologies, uh, geography or geographical considerations, um, and things like that. Um, but in the American case, grand strategy is also shaped uh, by our dominant uh, ideology, an ideology uh, of liberalism, uh, or what some people have referred to uh, as our liberal tradition. Um, and if you want my thumbnail sketch uh, of American grand strategy, at least over the past 50 years, uh, I would argue that uh, when the United States has uh, faced an international environment uh, in which uh, it's been uh, uh, countered uh, by another great power, uh, it's tended to behave uh, quite prudently and in a restrained fashion. Um, and this is uh, containment and selective engagement uh, during the Cold War. The problem for us is that when we are not uh, facing a peer competitor, uh, our ideology uh, tends to uh, take over. 
Um, and indeed, uh, liberalism, uh, I've argued in another place, uh, has a tendency uh, to lead us to see threats where none exist and also to try to remake the world um, in our own image. Um, and again, I'm giving you sort of a thumbnail of an argument that I spun out at great length in an article in International Security uh, in 2008. So let's talk about uh, grand strategy in action. And I'll give you sort of my uh, take uh, on the 20th and uh, first decade of the 21st century and how these different grand strategies uh, have uh, worked or more often how they've not worked um, for the United States. Uh, collective security uh, epitomized uh, in Woodrow Wilson's vision uh, of the League of Nations and the institutionalization of a multilateral security uh, community in Europe uh, after World War I uh, failed uh, pretty much uh, abjectly. This was in part due to domestic politics within the United States. It wasn't uh, politically very popular. But it seems to me that even had there been uh, significant support for the League of Nations in the United States and a greater American commitment to the League, uh, it's not clear that it would have resolved the problems in Europe that also ultimately uh, set, up the, uh, uh, set the stage for the Second World War. Um, Another manifestation of collective security, in my view, was the Clinton administration uh, in the period between uh, 1992 um, and uh, 2000, uh, a period uh, of soft primacy, but one that still fell within the, uh, the basic framework of collective security and leads me to impugn collective security based on that experience. Now, primacy. We have an experience of the United States uh, pursuing primacy, and that's basically uh, the Bush administration uh, from 9-11 um, on. Uh, and what's the track record look like here? Uh, it seems to me it's pretty uh, abysmal. Would anyone argue that Afghanistan uh, has been a success? Now, Afghanistan, uh, I think uh, at least uh, you know, the operation against the Taliban uh, after 9-11 uh, qualifies uh, as a necessary use of American military force. I know that's become uh, controversial again uh, given the, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, intelligence that's come out of the uh, uh, bin Laden compound in Pakistan. But I think you could still make a good argument that uh, the United States needed to respond against the Taliban uh, after 9-11. Uh, but what's really been a failure in Afghanistan has been the larger project uh, of nation building, uh, which I don't think, and I think most people uh, would concede, has uh, been pretty ineffectual to date. Uh, Libya, um, a, uh, uh, a project under the current administration, also I think a uh, manifestation of uh, primacy, uh, has pretty much turned out to be a mess. Will Ruger's in the back. He's going to say something about uh, my uh, previous enthusiasm for the uh, Libya operation, uh, and I'll take my lumps when the time comes. But it seems to me Iraq is really the poster child for the uh, failure of primacy. Uh, and I don't think that there's any really convincing way to argue uh, that uh, the policies begun uh, by the Bush administration uh, in the spring of 2003 um, have been by any means uh, successful. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll be even uh, more radical about this uh, and say that I think we're worse off with Saddam Hussein gone in Iraq than we were with him there. I warned you that this would be a polemical talk, so uh, just something to keep you awake. And then finally, uh, thank God uh, that the current president did not stick to his red lines in Syria, because uh, that could have been a mess as well. Now, selective engagement. 
two cheers for selective engagement. I was a selective engager uh, during the Cold War. Uh, I think it was the right strategy for the United States. We were facing a military peer competitor. Uh, I don't think this military competitor was quite as uh, uh, powerful or as threatening uh, as we thought at the time, uh, but I think that uh, the necessity for containing the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China during the Cold War, and particularly focusing on the key areas of the world, Western Europe, Northeast Asia, and the Persian Gulf uh, made eminent good sense. But my argument is that uh, selective engagement and containment were an artifact of a particular uh, geopolitical configuration uh, that's long since passed, um, which is what leads me to think now is uh, the time for restraint. Okay. Um, now I'll go through this pretty quickly because I want to really get to the, uh, the politics of uh, restraint, but I do want to throw some of this uh, out for you. Um, a bunch of reasons to think that restraint is the right grand strategy uh, for today. First of all, the idea that the United States can preserve the fortuitous geopolitical position it had after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, I think is, uh, is naive. Uh, unipolarity, uh, a situation in which uh, there's only one great power, uh, it, it's like Brigadoon. It, it comes around once every hundred years, but it doesn't stay. And in fact, it was largely an artifact, where's the spell check when you need it, uh, of the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union. Okay, so uh, the natural dynamics of international politics work against unipolarity. Uh, and swimming against uh, that tide, uh, I think, is a mistake. Secondly, and maybe more controversial, more controversial, uh, more controversially, no, that's not right, <laughs> uh, 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 with a bit more controversy, I think primacy is not necessary uh, or essential uh, to U.S. national security. And this is why the 92 defense policy guidance, in my view, was so uh, wrong-headed. Uh, first of all, the dominant trend in international politics is for states to balance against preponderant power. It's more important than ideology. It's more important than commitment to world order goals. This is sort of the universal constant, the physics uh, of international politics. Secondly, in reinforcing the balancing dynamics of international politics, balancing against threats, the one ism in international politics today uh, that really matters is nationalism. The idea uh, that uh, people are committed uh, to having their own autonomous uh, nation states. So the combination of these two things is the animating feature, uh, the electrical current that uh, drives the international system. And if that's the case, it has two implications. One is it means that uh, primacy uh, is not likely to last because other countries uh, are going to have a tendency, no matter what they think about our ideology or uh, our economic system, to balance against us um, in some way. That's the bad news. But the good news is, is if they're balancing against us, they're also going to balance against the Chinese, the Iranians. Uh, pick your favorite uh, malefactor. Third thing is uh, nuclear weapons, and particularly mutual assured destruction, has a powerful impact in terms of reinforcing uh, the status quo uh, among states in the international system. Uh, reinforced uh, by uh, the phenomenon uh, of geography, and particularly if you're fortunate, like the United States, to have two big moats uh, on either uh, side, and two weak countries north and south of you, uh, you're likely to, uh, to be very secure. Okay, so uh, primacy is not sustainable, it's not necessary. Here's where it really gets fun. Uh, it's also pernicious, and it's pernicious in two senses. One is, uh, was it Lord Acton who said that absolute power corrupts absolutely? 
Uh, I think that there is a international politics uh, analogy to that. And in fact, we've, uh, we've seen it uh, in the United States over the past 20 years. If you have too much power, you're likely to overreach, uh, which I think we've done. Um, secondly, uh, a, a situation of uh, hegemony or unipolarity uh, creates what economists call a moral hazard problem uh, for other states um, in the uh, international system. Now, one manifestation of the moral hazard problem of American hegemony, and this, by the way, uh, isn't new. It was something we talked a lot about uh, during the Cold War in terms of uh, burden sharing within NATO. Uh, th and that's the, uh, the free riding problem. Uh, when you have one big power that's committed to some common enterprise, the smaller powers uh, actually have uh, less incentive to contribute their fair share uh, to that common enterprise. And of course, in the NATO context, uh, it was uh, wickedly difficult to get anybody, uh, except maybe for the Germans, to come anywhere close to uh, providing the resources uh, that they should have provided in terms of uh, NATO forces. Um, but there's uh, another related moral hazard problem. Uh, that my friend Barry Posen at MIT calls it the reckless driving problem. Uh, that uh, the prospect of US hegemony uh, combined uh, with a strong alliance situation um, can lead states to behave um, in uh, fashion uh, that's not good for them uh, and not good for other people as well. <laughs> And two examples that I would point to would be uh, Israel in the occupied territories um, and Ukraine vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Russian speakers um, in the West. These are both cases uh, where support from the United States, or at least perceived support from the United States, uh, has led countries uh, to behave in ways that uh, are otherwise suboptimal. Now, I know both of these are probably controversial and we'll want to argue about it um, in the, uh, the Q&A, but I would simply say uh, that uh, it's very hard for me to see uh, a happy ending uh, for Israel uh, if it maintains uh, the uh, control uh, of the occupied territories uh, in over the next 10 or 15 years given the demographic trends there. Now I'm not saying that having a Palestinian state next to it uh, would be sweetness and light, um, but it's certainly uh, the problems of that pale uh, from the problems uh, of a, a, a single state with a, a Palestinian majority, which is where uh, demographics are leading things to go. But in any case, uh, I develop uh, these arguments, uh, hopefully, in a little bit more satisfying detail uh, in a piece I had in Notre Dame Magazine. Um, and what I really wanted to uh, get to, uh, after clearing my throat for a half hour here, John, how much time do I have? Okay, a little bit more. <laughs> of course, I thought it's been a little bit so far. So uh, I, I'll take 10 minutes, run through my argument, yeah, and uh, then we'll open it up for discussion. So um, an obvious question uh, that you might have at this point is, if restraint is so good, uh, why haven't we adopted it? Why isn't it uh, something that everybody is uh, hopping on board uh, to uh, embrace? Um, and I, I think the, uh, in terms of our uh, political, uh, uh, you know, our sort of political landscape, I think the Democratic Party is basically hopeless uh, on the restraint issue. I, I think that the uh, Democratic Party has been, at least since uh, the Reagan era, uh, trying to compensate for this image that they're all George McGovern Democrats or Jimmy Carter uh, warmed over. And so uh, Hillary Clinton, once she's uh, uh, finally uh, crowned uh, the Democratic nominee, I expect to be uh, more hawkish uh, than, uh, uh, than not. Um, and I think that's a function of, you know, sort of 
uh, ancient history in American politics. It's actually within the Republican Party that the foreign policy debates uh, are going to be more interesting. Now, on the one hand, uh, the neoconservative uh, primacist uh, approach to foreign policy uh, is pretty well entrenched in the GOP, at least among the base um, and among uh, many of the uh, people you see as, uh, as identified as uh, Republican uh, foreign policy uh, thinkers and likely staffers for Republican uh, campaigns or uh, administrations. Um, and the argument here is, uh, in part, uh, a standard one in American politics. The primary process has a tendency on both sides uh, to pull candidates uh, to the ideological uh, extreme. And of course, then the problem is uh, they get the nomination uh, and it's the Mitt Romney problem. They've got to sort of backpedal and uh, go back uh, to the middle to get the, uh, the median voter. Um, so those are all real things, um, but I think there are some uh, reasons for hope uh, if you're a restrainer, and that's what I want to sort of spin out here. Now, we're going to have a quiz. I'm a college professor. Anytime I see a room full of uh, uh, attentive faces, uh, I always want to uh, give a pop quiz. So I've got two quotes here. They're both by the same individual. Uh, they're not made up. Uh, read those quotes. Um, and uh, uh, you know the answer, so uh, you, you're, you're not, you don't get a shot. Um, I want somebody under uh, uh, 25 to tell me who this was. <laughs> Is there anybody under 25 in the room? 25 what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Th this was, uh, Governor George W. Bush from Texas in uh, October uh, of 2000 in the second debate in St. Louis uh, with Vice President uh, Al Gore. Uh, I don't think our troops ought to be used for nation building. Uh, our nation stands alone right now in the world in terms of power and that's why we have to be humble. Um, it's really ancient history because uh, most of us, uh, when we think of the, uh, the Bush era, uh, think of the George W. Bush uh, of mission accomplished. Um, but that was not the foreign policy uh, platform that uh, Governor Bush ran on in 2000 and uh, won with in 2000. So let me blow through some of the hopeful trends and then open it up for discussion because I really want your uh, input into this. First of all, uh, trend number one that's hopeful. Um, support is growing for a less activist uh, foreign policy. Now all the data I've got here uh, I've stolen shamelessly from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs uh, which uh, does a regular series of uh, public opinion surveys uh, on foreign policy type issues and I guess they gave me the data because I'm on the advisory board for this so I'm not really stealing it but if, if you ask or if you look, going back to 1947, and they have data going back all the way to 1947, uh, about uh, whether uh, the respondents think that the United States should take an active part in world affairs, uh, the internationalist consensus of the Cold War period uh, is generally declining. Uh, it's still a majority position, but if you look at the trends, uh, it seems to me pretty clear. Secondly, uh, war weariness. Iraq and Afghanistan uh, are not popular. And they're not popular across the political spectrum. Uh, sure, uh, Republicans are a little bit more wedded to uh, the idea that Iraq was a great success. But you know, even there, 60% uh, of people who self-identify as Republicans uh, think that Iraq uh, was a debacle. Um, there's also been a declining sense of threat. Now, John Mueller, who uh, knows a lot more about uh, uh, public opinion than I'll ever know, uh, reminded me that the resurgence of ISIS, uh, especially in Iraq, um, has caused an uptick uh, in public concern about uh, terrorism recently. But again, the secular trend 
since 2001 uh, has been uh, for the public to put terrorism more in context, which has meant uh, that it's uh, been regarded as uh, less perilous uh, as it might otherwise be. Um, what you're seeing also is, uh, among uh, people who are surveyed uh, is the sense that uh, the United States should be focusing exclusively on direct threats to our national security as opposed to threats to other countries' national security, um, that we should be looking, uh, we should be pursuing policies that advance our interest rather than promoting uh, a particular vision uh, of world order um, and also uh, domestic problems, okay? Um, so that, I think, is uh, compatible uh, with restraint. Now, to be sure, Americans want the United States to maintain a military second to none. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But the question that that raises is how much is enough? Um, and I've got uh, some data here. Uh, I don't know how clear uh, this pie chart is, but the uh, bar chart here should give you a, a good sense. If you looked at military spending in U.S. dollars um, in 2013, uh, you would see that the United States outspends uh, the next likely uh, peer competitors uh, by a significant uh, extent. Now, if you assume, using the old rule of thumb, uh, that you want a three to one advantage uh, over a potential uh, adversary, um, and if we thought our potential adversary was uh, the People's Republic of China uh, or of Russia, uh, what this tells me is uh, we're overspending at least uh, in the case of uh, China by about uh, 200 uh, billion dollars uh, and by uh, and over Russia uh, by a lot more. Now, on the other hand, if we assume that the bad guys uh, to uh, conduct their nefarious activities uh, need uh, a three to one advantage uh, in terms of uh, having a chance uh, of prevailing where they're at, uh, you need to understand uh, that uh, that plays uh, to our advantage uh, because uh, we should be able to conduct uh, defensive military operations uh, with a lot less than they have. Now I'm not saying that we ought to cut defense spending to anywhere near these levels. What I'm simply saying is we're spending a hell of a lot of money and a hell of a lot more than the uh, most likely candidates uh, for uh, future uh, conflict with the United States. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the politics of restraint. I think I'll stop there um, and uh, just get into my what is to be done uh, in the conclusion. Um, many people, I suspect, including the uh, graybeards in the audience, would say uh, this professor from South Bend, Indiana is in peddling restraint. He must be, you know, some guy who rolled down from the Institute for Policy Studies over there on DuPont Circle or the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, or uh, some sort of uh, left-wing organization. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the, the first sort of major uh, argument for restraint in recent American history did come from the left and Senator George McGovern's uh, come home America uh, argument uh, in 1972. Um, and today, you know, if you watch Fox, uh, uh, Fox News, uh, you know, uh, their view uh, of President Obama's uh, uh, restrained, not restrained enough, but more restrained than W, uh, foreign policy agendas uh, is that uh, he never met a uh, red line uh, that he wouldn't let somebody cross. Um, but I actually think that it's, uh, when you look at the data, that it's Republicans and independents, uh, and I put myself in these categories uh, rather than uh, among the Democrats, uh, who are increasingly wary uh, of an activist foreign policy. And in fact, um, the Chicago Council's uh, 2014 uh, 
uh, survey uh, had a uh, broke down uh, the question of uh, staying out of world affairs by political affiliation um, and what you see is that it's independents uh, who are the most sympathetic to that and then Republicans uh, it's the Democrats who remain uh, committed to uh, a, uh, a residual uh, position of uh, an activist uh, foreign policy. Um, so I want to stop here. I got a lot more PowerPoint slides and you may provoke me over the course of the uh, Q&A to uh, deploy some of them. But I think you've got a, a sense uh, of uh, where I'm at. Um, and I'd like your reactions to this because again it's uh, you know polemical not an analytical piece and it's also something uh, that a number of us are sort of trying to uh, think through so uh, I'd welcome your uh, questions comments uh, speeches uh, maligning of my character uh, anything that you want to do please you want me to take the okay Thank you for your presentation and coming here to the Institute of World Politics. My name is Jeffrey Dean Capel. I'm a student here, and I happen to actually be an unapologetic neoconservative who, it seems like you, part of your career, made it a, whose policies you attacked throughout your career. Subsequently, I have some... I'm, I'm I'm malign, I malign neoconservatives uh, even in my sleep. <laughs> no, I, 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 read, I read some of your pieces. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that bit of... Uh, ideology aside, just from an analytical perspective, I see a lot of different holes in your presentation. That said, I wanted to focus on two that kind of jumped out. If you go back to slide five. Uh, I think Which one slide is slide five? five? Uh, dealt with primacy is not natural. That's where you made that argument. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about. Go ahead. So you said it's not natural, and I would contend that seems to be a rather odd way of looking at it when one takes a look at, say, 5,000 years of human history as it's defined by long cycle structural theory and underwritten by the law of unequal growth and law of demand. It seems like your analysis focuses or anchors on one particular aspect of long cycle theory, right? which it takes a structural element. You talked about Waltz in one of your pieces. He takes a more uh, multi-level analysis of the system. Long cycle structural theory adds a intertemporal scope to that analysis. So yeah, I mean, there are times where you'll have um, what is it counterbalancing and you have a diffusion of power. That said, because of the law of unequal growth and law of demand, natural centers of gravity arise. So what would you say to somebody who says that, you know, it seems that when somebody focuses on one aspect of long cycle, the long cycle, which says that in the, you know, after a uh, you know, hegemon reaches its period of apogee or, or you know, maximum point of ascension, that you have counterbalancing that that somehow uh, dictates that the system doesn't support unipolarity overall? Yeah, uh, I, that's a, a great question. Um, and I don't deny that there have been periods, uh, in, regular periods, I would go so far to say, in which you've had a top dog. We well, uh, said kings like, a, like was it once every hundred years or something. You made like Bra well, Bra like Bra uh, Brigadoon. Brigadoon, right. The, the, the argument is not that it doesn't happen, but rather that it's unsustainable. And uh, take, uh, again, this is sort of an old book now, uh, but you know, Paul Kennedy's uh, you know, great uh, book of the uh, early 1990s, The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. The, the process that you describe of great powers rising and falling is a ubiquitous uh, feature of history for the period that, that you've mentioned. My, my point about it being unsustainable is what goes up must come down. Now the problem for me with the uh, neoconservative uh, primacy agenda was they had convinced themselves, or you had convinced yourself since you've identified with the movement, um, that it would be possible for the United States to maintain over the longer term a position of primacy. And the argument as I understand it is uh, uh, twofold. Uh, one is that uh, America is different uh, because uh, the natural dynamics of balancing uh, would not operate against us because we're a democracy and because we're a... Uh, That's not my position, uh, sir. No, no, I'm, I'm uh, caricaturing, well, I'm summarizing the broad uh, neoconservative uh, position. Um, and that secondly, that there were things that we could do in terms of our uh, maintaining our material 
uh, position of uh, primacy um, in the world. I just don't think. I think the, exactly the history that you're recounting suggests that that would actually be a foolish way of thinking uh, about American strategy. If you believe exactly as you describe the dynamics of international politics, uh, it's what goes up must come down. A quick follow up Please. question because it actually, you touched on it, you said it was not natural, that's kind of why I was saying it seemed a little, it seems like um, you're looking at the decline, or you're using the decline of historical system leaders that were regional hegemons constrained by the lack of uh, technological advancements surrounding transportation technology which maximizes the stopping power of water loss and strength rating. Can you go to the next slide? Um, you said there, uh, it might have been the one after this, one where you talked about MAD and stopping power of water. Is that the same slide? Is that the same slide? Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so, I mean, you discount the impact of revolutionary structure technologies that no longer constrain system leaders, right? I mean, so Rome was a regional power because it wasn't very good at Navy. It wasn't good at, at, at having a good Navy. And water stopped it from going across the world. Right, I'm just using that as a basic example. Well, that no longer exists today. Um, well, I don't, I don't accept that premise. And, and in fact, I think the uh, idea uh, that... Uh, You're saying that the advancements of transportation technology haven't minimized the loss of strength, rain, stop, and power of water? No, what I'm saying is, is that the... Uh, no, what I'm saying is that the uh, adversary can respond uh, using these uh, same technologies uh, to uh, essentially asymmetrically. asymmetrically. So then wouldn't that undermine your calculation based on a three to one ratio that's based on industrial warfare fighting indexes that doesn't take into account revolutionary relative technologies and military affairs? No, I, I don't. Because I think ultimately, uh, you know, I mean, whether the three to one rule is, uh, you know, exactly uh, the number that you need. Uh, the evidence, it seems to me, that if you're going to conduct military operations successfully, that uh, the attacker needs, uh, a, you know, some uh, measure of preponderance over the defender uh, still exists. That's that's pretty straightforward. Um, and the the idea that water doesn't still operate uh, in terms of uh, the loss of strength ratio, despite the real developments in transportation technology, uh, it seems to me, is not a compelling argument. You're basing that on the force projection with the goal of conquest? That discounts actors that don't act hyper-rationally, and that was one of the criticisms I had regarding Matt. Um, all actors are not hyper-rational or deep rational. They frame their positions from different domains of gain or loss. And they make oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're yeah. throwing a lot of get mud against the wall, and I'm happy to throw the mud back. I, I would just simply say, if you don't think MAD operates, uh, show me an example uh, of a country uh, that has uh, behaved uh, in a fashion incompatible with MAD. Um, and I would simply say to you, Exhibit A, uh, is Mao's China, country that when it didn't have nuclear weapons uh, uh, talked in most hair-raising uh, terms about the effects of nuclear weapons on statecraft. Uh, once Mao's China got nuclear weapons, at least in the area uh, of nuclear strategy, they behaved as if uh, Robert McNamara uh, was advising them uh, about uh, how states uh, should act with nuclear weapons. But we, we should let somebody else uh, get into this, please. Yeah, I have a lot of quick, uh, first statement. I was raised in neocon. I mean, Donald Russell called me the brat when I was 10. And that was when I was secretary of the first time. And um, that's how I got my Is gone, but there's going to be a new neocon. And I know that I came in late. 
Do I see anything? As far as down the pipe with your formulas that you've come up with, or with the Iraq primacy, and what, what you talk about the future and how things are mapped, do you get just the old school way, or is that going forward in the future for new policies? Well, I, uh, I, my uh, brief, I hope, is forward looking. I mean, a lot of you know my argument for restraint. Uh, is saying uh, if we were to uh, adopt uh, the, you know, a more restrained grand strategy, it would be better uh, for the United States. So in a sense, it's not, uh, you know, I have some historical evidence that I think uh, supports these projections, um, but it's very much a, uh, you know, a forward-looking uh, exercise in terms of saying we should be doing this. We haven't, you know, uh, done it across uh, across the board. I guess the, the, the question about uh, technology though in particular and how it will uh, advantage the United States um, you know, strikes me as a, a, a little bit different question. Uh, the, the technology that everybody want to talk, wants to talk about uh, these days is cyber. Um, and uh, you know, there's some uh, some very interesting uh, dynamics associated with uh, uh, with the cyber realm. Um, and you know, I think that th this is an area. You know, I can't really uh, you know sort of spin this out uh, tonight because it would be a, a whole separate discussion. But it, it seems to me that one could think about the cyber threat in a very different way than the uh, policy debate about it um, is conducted uh, these days. Um, and just to sort of caricature the policy debate, you know, if you were to read the newspaper, we'd have this image that, uh, you know, there's a cyber war going on out there. I think that is true. Um, and that the Chinese um, are, uh, you know, along with the, uh, the Russians, uh, are major players um, in using cyber to advance uh, national objectives. And I think there's no doubt that both those countries are doing that. On the other hand, I think the, uh, the reality is that uh, there is a cyber 800-pound gorilla in the world, and it's us. The United States is so far ahead uh, of these other countries um, that, you know, we sort of lose uh, the forest for the trees in uh, focusing uh, only on those uh, two, uh, two actors. Um, but I do think the, the fact that, um, that the uh, cyber technology uh, is so diffused, not only in terms of our military capability, but also in terms of our uh, civilian economy and civilian society, um, that it is going to be an important issue going forward. Uh, but how to think about it uh, outside the framework uh, of you know traditional great power politics, uh, I think is uh, the challenge for us um, in the uh, in the future. Um, and there's been some you know some work on this. Joe Nye had a piece comparing cyber. Uh, and uh, the nuclear revolution that I thought was not very good. Um, but there were uh, a number of pieces in the Journal of Strategic Studies and International Security uh, that came out in response to it that I think, uh, you know, uh, put cyber in a more realistic uh, context than it has been so far. Please. Wild West in cyber these days. And I think for us to take some sense of assurance in that, 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 is so, that this construct of mutual assured destruction is somehow acting in our benefit, particularly in the cyber domain, I, I, I have difficulty reconciling that with the facts. 
then yes, the U.S. government, I would agree, is something like that 800-pound gorilla. I give you your point on that. However, our civilian and commercial enterprise, we need no look, look no further than the recent Sony activity, it is massively vulnerable. And the potential for, for large-scale implications on our way of life from the cyber domain, I think we're in a very uh, uncertain era because the rules of engagement have, have not even be, hardly begun. Yeah, let, 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 let me make two responses. First of all, I do have a question there, but go ahead. Well, please a ask your question. Well, the question is on a slightly different subject, which is on your basic definition of grand strategy. I would be much more uh, willing to accept most of, many of your points had you said military strategy rather than grand strategy, because in fact, Many of the things you point to as the failures of these elements, I would argue, open disclosure, several decades in the US military, so take that for what it's worth, were not so much associated with the implementation of US military power as our inability to win the peace. So your basic definition of grand strategy, which appears to be very limited to the execution of the military instrument. Clearly, the Chinese do not accept that definition. I mean, there, theirs is a whole of the nation state, political, economic, military, social, et cetera, that they see as the scope for grand strategy. So uh, I'm curious as to how you respond to that fundamental approach that you took in terms of scoping the topic. Guilty. <laughs> Guilty. Look, there's, uh, there's been a long debate uh, about how to define grand strategy, you know, for 20 years. Um, and definitions uh, are, uh, you know, are important in one sense, but the, the burden on uh, the definer is to use uh, the definition that he or she comes up with consistently. So, this is my definition of grand strategy. You know, if you don't like it, uh, you know, Charlie Hill uh, would be happy to define grand strategy in a broader way uh, than uh, than you do. But I, I don't I don't see that as uh, an analytical problem. As long as you know what I'm talking about, you're saying I'm talking about the use of military force. You don't have a problem with my grand or my definition. You have a problem uh, with uh, my focus on military force. And I think, you know, it's reasonable uh, to say uh, that uh, you should be talking about foreign policy, not grand strategy, but it's my talk, and so I get to say what, what I want to say. <laughs> but let me just get to... I, Right, right, which is why I said grand strategy and not national security strategy. Let me just talk real quickly about the uh, issues you raised uh, initially, because um, frankly, I didn't quite get what your problem was. Mutual assured destruction is about nuclear weapons. The effect uh, of MAD uh, on statecraft uh, is that it reduces the likelihood that another state is going to use nuclear weapons against a nuclear weapon state. Uh, that's all I'm saying there. That doesn't preclude that uh, another state might not engage uh, in cyber operations uh, against a nuclear weapon state. I think your point on China was well taken in that regard. My question is, so you expect the same change in behavior by an Iran? Yes, yes, that's my prediction. I, I hope you're right. Like I said, you know, I, I love it when people tell me, uh, and, and you're a graybeard, so I'm, I'm sort of shocked that I have to give you this lecture. It's usually the young people uh, who know nothing uh, about Mao's China, the, the China of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, the China in which the top leadership said that nuclear weapons are the teeth in the paper mache 
uh, uh, United States, um, and that if there's a nuclear war, the socialist world will come out on top because you know we've got a billion people and uh, they've only got half a billion people. So uh, uh, we we could uh, come, you know, we we could fight and win a nuclear war. That was the rhetoric of Mao's China. One of the most egregious human rights violators of the 20th century, and that's saying something. That a regime like that, once it gets nuclear weapons, behaves uh, much the same way that other nuclear states behaved with nuclear weapons, with restraint and caution, leads me to say that anybody sa who says the Iranians are crazier than the Chinese uh, are just don't uh, understand uh, history. I mean, it just it, it doesn't uh, it, it doesn't compute for me. Please in the back. Yeah, I'm back to your original. We got an interesting test in this room because yeah, <laughs> I'm guessing a fundamental uh, challenge to my thesis. Which slide? The last one I. Uh, was the poll. And I'm a little concerned that you're reading too much into that poll. If you look at the question, this is about the partisan breakdown of. Yeah, I know, uh, yeah, I know which one you're talking about. Sorry. There you go. All right, so it says, do you think it will be best for the future of the country if we take an active part in world affairs or if we stay out of world affairs? I feel like you're going further than the, than the question is asking and talking about military affairs. I can see Republicans reading that question and saying, no, we don't want to be part of the UN. Mm -hmm. I can see uh, Democrats saying that and saying, yes, well, well no, no less foreign aid. I mean, there, I think there's so many more interpretations of that question. You're putting, uh, a lot more into, or a lot more in, um, a more narrow definition of what that world affairs means than I think the respondent would uh, think about if they were answering that question. Well, you know, I mean, that's a fundamental issue with uh, survey research, and you know, I'll defer to. John Mueller, who's a, a real expert uh, on this, uh, who, who could uh, speak um, more authoritatively on this. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. That, you know, one of the challenges uh, of uh, survey design is to figure out whether you're really asking people uh, what you want to know from them. And, and I think it's entirely possible that uh, people um, from uh, different political persuasions might interpret this question uh, a little bit differently. But on the other hand, the beauty of the Chicago Council surveys is uh, you can cross-reference this stuff with a lot of other uh, questions to get a sense of whether um, you know what's going on is apples and oranges, or whether in fact this represents a uh, uh, a real trend. Um, and I do think that uh, that it represents uh, a real trend in the sense when you go back and look at the. Uh, uh, declining uh, support for the proposition that uh, Iraq was worth it. I, I mean, the trends are downwards, even among Republicans. The majority of Republicans today, in answer to that question, will say Iraq wasn't worth it. And I don't think that this is a, uh, uh, a referendum on Barack Obama's uh, conduct uh, in uh, Iraq. Uh, after 2008. I think it's a uh, retrospective judgment uh, on the initial decision uh, to uh, engage militarily in Iraq. I, I agree with you. I think the Iraq question would be more relevant broken down to partisanship than that question. Well, it, it is broken down by uh, partisans. No. What I'm saying, I would go with more interested in seeing uh, was Iraq worth it up there. I think that would have more, that breaks down as more interesting telling us the story of whether our restraint would be a viable political option than that question. That's all okay, I'm all right, yeah, thank you. Uh, please. Uh, yeah, I, I thought the talk was really compelling. I, I, I was very much convinced by looking at Uncle Frank, thank you for coming. Anyway, but I wanted to hear the kind of punchline that you seem to be uh, tantalizing us with. You know, I, I, even though a lot of um, what you say is compelling to me. I'm wondering 
not just about this room, but about how uh, one could, in fact, sell this politically in the current climate, especially with, with I guess I'd say, four different things that I see as very problematic, namely the ease of fear-mongering among the American populace. Um, and I, I think that trend line you showed where uh, terrorism fears went up as ISIS was more and more discussed, even though... No, no, it, we, it went down until recently. So, you know, what the, the uh, data I had shows a spike, you know, right after 9-11 and then a, a general downward slope. Now, you know, it's gone up again this year a little bit, but, you know, my sense is that uh, the general uh, trend is still downwards from where it was at the admit admittedly, you know, very high point of uh, September 11th. Okay, but more generally, it just seems that it, it, I, I would like to hear how you, stra what strategies you think could work given what I would still say is the ease of fear mongering about even things that are relatively unlikely to threaten America's national security, like terrorism, as opposed to individual security of individual Americans. Also, the power of interest politics and the power of, you might say, military industrial conflicts. Uh, and also, from the other side, kind of this sense that we need to be engaged because of our humanitarian values and the need to help, for instance, um, people in Christians in, in Iraq and Syria. And also, I, I think a final point, the, the degree to which the people and voices who got us into Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya for that matter are still extremely powerful voices in foreign policy defending all of these policies. How do we overcome those sorts of things to reach the policy of restraint? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of uh, critical issues that you raised in your question. I don't, I don't think I can, can touch on all of them. But, but let me just spin out very quickly, and this will give me the opportunity to uh, uh, finish uh, a couple of the slides that I, uh, I didn't get to. How would I make the case? And, and let me uh, throw some things out and, uh, and see how you respond. Because the, the case would have to be made in a way that you would build uh, a coalition uh, both within the Republican Party and with independents uh, in favor of this uh, grand strategy. So I, I had uh, six ideas. Uh, one is, uh, if you're a deficit hawk, if you're a budget hawk, you can't take defense spending off the table. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, I mean, you all know that uh, defense spending is about 55% uh, of the federal budget um, and that discretionary spending is uh, less than a third uh, of the total, uh, total budget. So if you want to cut government, uh, uh, military spending uh, is a, an area that has to be cut. Okay, I, I, I'll get... Uh, let me get through this. So that's, uh, that's one issue I would point to. Second issue would be uh, the long-term uh, health care costs uh, of the uh, last 10 years. Um, the, uh, you know, the uh, human costs of the war, uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, on our veterans uh, are something that we're going to be paying for uh, for a long time. Not huge, but on the other hand, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, has demonstrated uh, its inability to uh, deal with this. Um, third issue is nation building. If you don't believe in nation building in the United States, why in God's name would you think that it would work uh, in third world countries? Now. You know, I mean, uh, the skepticism about, uh, you know, the welfare state uh, and large social programs used to be a staple uh, on, among conservatives. Um, that, that logic uh, isn't also applied to uh, nation building abroad strikes me as a little bit anomalous. Uh, civil liberties. Uh, this is a big issue. 
Uh, and uh, it's an issue that uh, we've seen directly manifested uh, in Republican Party debates. The, uh, uh, it was House Republicans in that the uh, Republican-dominated uh, uh, Congress uh, who led the charge to uh, rein in uh, Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act. Uh, which is the, uh, you know, the provision that's been interpreted to provide authorization uh, for the wholesale collection uh, of metadata uh, in terms of telephony and uh, other electronic communication. So there are a, a lot of people, I think, who could come together um, on that. Um, another argument uh, that I think could have legs is uh, supporting the troops. Now, if you support the troops, uh, it's not only uh, about supporting the, uh, the troops uh, in terms of defense spending uh, and uh, you know, things like that. It's also about remembering that there's a human cost of when you send America's men and women to war. Now, I'm not saying that we wouldn't want to pay that human cost in certain cases, and I think the overthrow of the Taliban after 9-11 was certainly one that I thought was worth uh, risking the treasure, but especially the blood uh, of America's men and women in uniform. Um, but think about it. Uh, isn't there broad, a broad sense uh, that uh, we care about the men and women who volunteered to uh, support our country? Um, and isn't one way to honor their service to be very careful uh, about when we actually uh, send them in harm's way? Final thing is, uh, and this is the most polemical uh, of the many polemical points that I've made tonight. Um, but uh, I can't sort of let this go. Uh, the big threat for us today uh, is uh, international terrorism. And how Iraq and international terrorism got linked in the public mind uh, is something uh, I still don't fully understand. Because the reality was that the, pr the uh, presence of Al-Qaeda uh, and the uh, precursors of ISIS um, in Iraq prior to March of 2003 was non-existent. It is true. No, it's not true. It is true. There is absolutely no evidence uh, of any collaboration between uh, the Hussein regime and Al-Qaeda. And you can, you can shake your head all you want, but it's just not simply there. Today, we have a situation in which Iraq has become a failed state. Now, the dead-enders uh, will argue that, well, the great victory uh, of the surge in 2008 was uh, uh, squandered. Uh, by the pusillanimity uh, of the Obama administration. I'm here to tell you, I remember the arguments that were made in 2003, and nobody told me we were going to war in March of 2003 uh, to have a permanent American military commitment in Iraq. Uh, the arguments at the time were made that we're going to go now, we're going to find weapons of mass destruction, and by the way, uh, we're going to start a process of regime change uh, in the Middle East that's going to make it possible for us actually to reduce America's uh, military footprint in the region. Those were the arguments that were made at the time, uh, and they've all turned out to be uh, completely wrong. Now, the the issue then is those, it, it seems to me, maybe not all of those uh, uh, arguments, but many of them, it seems to me, would resonate both within the Republican Party and with independents that would sort of lean in that direction. And so that's how I'm thinking, you know, and again, this is sort of back of the envelope at this point uh, about how I would, uh, would sell this as a, uh, a policy. Your point about interest groups, I actually have thought a lot about, but I'll, I'll let somebody else get in and maybe we can talk about it off, uh, offline. Please. And I'm here, I'm here to bring you back into the so, bosom I of... <laughs> I spent a few years in Iraq and Pakistan, and, uh, and I came back to Morgantown neither. 
Oh, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> I also have a long-running passion affair with IR theory. Uh, I love its elegance and clarity. But the problem is I work on policy issues, and, and it, it, it typically fails to help me very much solve the problems that I face. Let's take a look at your four strategy here, your four options for strategy. I think are, are fairly straightforward and unobjectionable and close to prison. No. Uh, the, the problem I have with, with this typology of organized theory is you have to start with strategy serves policy. And those are simply means for executing policy objectives. And the problem that you're the thing that really animates you, I think, is this uh, expansive view of our policy interests and objectives. And I would argue those types are Republican and Democratic parties. There is no difference. They were at the end of the Bush administration and working at the dying days of this administration, it is very difficult for me to see the major differences in the execution of our foreign policy. And then as I look at your, your, your example of China and, and the spending uh, spending breakdown that you have there, I mean, I, that's kind of a bit of a straw man argument. I think you kind of know that our, our, our defense spending is, is uh, spread across the globe. It reflects our global interests. And so China is $150 million billion dollars we think, uh, stress we think, uh, spending is concentrated in the Asia Pacific. So the, 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 and the competition with the Chinese is not the same as it was with the Soviets. It's not global. It's principally regional. And that region we say is our number one priority in balance. I think there's a lot of that that says otherwise, but, but that's what we identify as our, as our, as our top objective. And so your argument might be, hey, take a look at your interests. Maybe you need to take a different approach to, to what you're doing in the Asia Pacific. And I say that, that might be appealing to me. I could find I could find a rationale for your, you know, a way to support your argument. But the problem is it doesn't seem to matter whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. You're not going to get to a position where we think our interests, the benefits of restraint, outweigh the benefits of being the predominant power. And I'll just talk to the Asia Pacific, that's right. That's focus on the predominant power in Egypt is an upholding the current distribution of power, maintaining our alliances, preserving the economic benefits we think we get that outweigh the benefits of restraint. And then I would just leave you with, other than Rand Paul, who Dana Milbank took a part in today's Washington Post in terms of his prospects for 2016, what, what individual in either part would it reasonably adopt this position of restraint? All of the, the policy changes which would be tectonic in, the, in, the, in their impact on us it would have to fall close. Yeah, I, I'm enough of a political realist, not a Morgenthau realist, but a political realist. Um, and I do, you know, out in the, uh, uh, you know, out in the, uh, uh, the hustings, you know, we do get the New York Times and the Washington Post. So I have a, you know, a general, yeah, <laughs> I do have a general sense of the, uh, the politics of this. Um, so I, I understand the currents I'm swimming against. On the other hand, I will say, and I'll say it with all due respect, because you and I are, you're back in the tribe and I want to welcome you, I want to welcome you uh, back. But I, I think you've been in the Beltway bubble uh, a little bit too long. Uh, that uh, you're treating the undeniable reality of the Beltway elite uh, political discourse as uh, being immutable. Uh, and let me tell you, uh, out in uh, South Bend, Indiana, or I'll tell you College Station, Texas, where I lived for four years, uh, or Lexington, Kentucky, where I spent six happy years, you would be surprised uh, how these sorts of arguments play. Now, I, I think you're right. If, if Rand Paul is the only avatar of this position, uh, it's probably not going to go anywhere. But let me take you back to Governor Bush's, Governor Jeb Bush's flip-flop. I don't think he's a dumb guy, and, and I don't think he's uh, spineless. I think his inconsistency uh, on the Iraq issue is uh, more, you know, it's like the canary in the coal mine of a, a larger set of tensions that are pulling him and I think pulling a lot of the other uh, Republican nominees in different directions. Now, 
Ted Cruz hopped on him right after uh, you know his bad week, and you know I'm I'm not persuaded that you know Cruz was thinking about this anything other than politically. But Chris Christie, you know, who I think is a, a sophisticated political animal, uh, understood uh, that it wasn't just about. Uh, you know, scoring points uh, when there's blood in the water with one of your potential uh, adversaries or uh, rivals, that it's also the fact, and I, again, I go back to the uh, survey data about uh, whether Iraq was worth it. Most people don't think Iraq was worth it, and 60% of Republicans don't think it's worth it. So what that tells you is that uh, at the least, Defending uh, Iraq to the uh, to the last Iraqi uh, may not be as good of uh, politics uh, as uh, you know some people might think. So I, I think that there is uh, there's room, uh, but I got to say that in, in in all honesty, you're absolutely right that there are uh, powerful uh, vested interests uh, that are supporting uh, a different. Uh, Grand strategy, um, and you know it's swimming against uh, business as usual for the past 20 years, uh, and that means you know that it's not going to be an easy, uh, uh, easy to uh, persuade people on this. All I'm saying, though, is I think there's evidence uh, that the, the the that it's worth taking a chance, and there are issues. It seems to me you could build the coalition around. Please. question that I would like to be a little bit of a, and I'm, this is, I'm sorry this has to be the last question, but I want it to be. Well, you paid for this microphone, yeah. John, so <laughs> that's your I, privilege. It be part of the theme of, of, of you know, uh, one of the items of discussion in this series. Um, I'm wondering if it is possible, in, as you see it, to have some kind of a combination of a policy of, um, for example, uh, collective security uh, and, and restraint as well. I mean, I happen to think that, I mean, I happen to believe that, that the United States, that so much of the world expects leadership from the United States and will not do anything in all kinds of places where there may be very destabilizing problems. I think people of goodwill and, and, and prudent judgment uh, can argue that, that our intervention in the Balkans was the right thing to do to prevent the metastasizing of a problem throughout southeastern Europe and even the Greek-Turkish war. I happen to disagree with that. I happen to disagree that, uh, with, with the wisdom of intervening in Iraq. I happen to disagree with, with trying to create a central government in, in Afghanistan when, when no such thing has ever really existed and it's a confederation of tribes. I think I disagree completely with the Libya thing and yet I believe that, that, that the United States uh, can play a, a role, a, 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 I don't know if you want to, I don't like to use the word primacy because, uh, but a, a very key strategic role in the world that can help maintain security through deterrence uh, and, and through collective means. And, um, and, and I believe that, that, you know, obviously there are powers like Russia and China. I think, by the way, a lot of those statistics about military spending, I share, I share uh, the, the view of, of, of one of the questioners, I think are, are very inaccurate. They remind me of the day when, when the CIA told us uh, that, that, that the uh, percentage of the Soviet military, uh, of the percentage of the Soviet economy devoted to the military was only 5% when it turned out to be 50%. Um, uh, I don't know how much it cost to build 3,000 miles of tunnels, uh, the underground Great Wall in China in which they're concealing their nu nuclear arsenal. That's probably not part of their defense statistics when I think it's a defense expenditure. I guess my, my, my question here is, is it possible to maintain the kind of strength that we have without a, a huge, huge increase, you know, without the increases particularly in our, in our armed forces, 
um, but to maintain a credible deterrent and not get ourselves involved in, in promiscuous military interventions where the absolute vital national interests of the United States are not at stake. Is it possible to do that? I mean, I think it is. And I think a hybrid of some of these uh, grand strategies is indeed possible, and I wanted just to get your reaction to this. Well, I, you know, let, let's talk about uh, the Western Pacific, um, Northeast Asia. I mean, because I, I think China is uh, the, uh, you know, the most likely peer competitor that the United States will face. And I think that there has to be some sort of security architecture in the region um, to respond to China. Now, where I think I would differ from you, John, and Michael, is it? I like that name, too, um, is uh, how essential is it for Uncle Sam uh, to uh, do the heavy lifting um, in this security architecture in order for it to, uh, to be effective. Um, and what, I, what I'm sort of hearing in your talk is, or in your question, is a verg version of the theory of hegemonic stability. If you don't have uh, one big power uh, that has a disproportionate interest in uh, the collective uh, success of the organization, you aren't going to get cooperation. Uh, I just don't buy that theory. Um, I, I'm reading different economists. I'm reading the economists who are teaching me about moral hazard problems. And I think what, you know, my, uh, you know, and, and I thought a lot about the, uh, the problem of the defense burden in NATO throughout the Cold War period is we had a real problem getting all of the allies with the arguable exception of the Germans uh, to pay their fair share. And I think it's not a stretch to think that uh, the, you know, the, uh, the British, the Benelux countries, the Italians, uh, all were thinking in the back of their minds, Uncle Sugar will take care of us. Uh, we can focus on other things. So our challenge then, uh, when you look at it from that framework, is how to ensure in uh, Northeast Asia uh, that uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, the ASEAN countries uh, contribute uh, their fair share uh, to the collective uh, maintenance of order in the region. And I don't think we need to uh, do as much as uh, many people think uh, to uh, build a counterbalancing coalition uh, against uh, China. Um, and in so I'm not, you know. This connection, then let me ask you what do you think about, what do you think about? A permanent, the, a permanent presence, even if it's smaller than it is today, in a place like South Korea, where the United States is not necessarily be doing the heavy lifting, but it is is bolstering deterrence by being a tripwire. Well, I, th you know, I think the, uh, you know, the uh, South Korea is one of the, uh, in my view, the few places where a continuing American military presence on the ground makes sense um, because, uh, you know, they're facing uh, a uh, potential adversary who's already once launched a war of conquest, has a rudimentary nuclear capability. Uh, I don't think they have a, uh, you know, a, a really potent military, but I'm also, you know, not persuaded that under certain circumstances, uh, at least at the conventional level, that the, South, or the North Koreans uh, might not do something uh, ill-advised. So I have no problem with that. And I think our presence there in general has been stabilizing. As I thought, uh, our presence, uh, especially in Germany during the Cold War, was stabilizing not only in terms of uh, external deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the Warsaw Pact, but also in terms of helping uh, resolve the long-standing German problem uh, for the rest of the Europeans. So again, restraint is not America come home. It's not no use of force. Um, and it's certainly not uh, about uh, a lack of engagement with the rest of the world. It's about a different way uh, of engaging with the rest of the world uh, than we have done in the past. 
Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.